Where do you flip it on? Hi. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Well, I'm I'm excited that so many of you came. I came half prepared because last time I did a workshop, we were around a picnic table over there. So I sort of had this vibe in my mind that we'd have a bunch of stuff in the middle of the table and we'd be sitting around and trying snacks and chatting and looking at little um, things. And then I noticed there are a lot more people here this year. <laughs> and uh, fortunately, the place we had had PowerPoint, so I said, I'm going to whip that PowerPoint out <laughs> here, and we can look at that. And then afterwards, if you want to linger, you can look at the real thing if you're not familiar. Uh, and I talked to so many people who already grow a lot of things, and I think a lot of you might know what the herbs and flowers you want look like. You just might not have bothered to save all those teeny tiny seeds. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so we're going to kind of get started and uh, you know the teas and snacks that are there we're gonna put in the snack place after the workshop is over so you can try them later if you don't take the time I made a, a little wet and dry seat handout for you and uh, I have some catalogs from Southern Exposure which you are welcome to take and lighten my load on the way home uh, and uh, what else is down there? Some information about our Heritage Harvest Festival that we have every year at uh, Monticello in Virginia. If you want to make a, a pilgrimage to Thomas Jefferson's home. Oh, my goodness. Somebody had this set up for uh, recording. Oh, my. Uh-oh. <laughs> well, well, well. <laughs> Excitement for everyone. Uh, okay, well, let's see how this works. Okay, so why do we want to save uh, herb and flower seeds? Really for a lot of the same reasons that we save our vegetable seeds. Uh, we want to preserve those varieties. We want to save a little money, you know. Uh, often the varieties that you are growing and you know are doing well in your area, are well adapted, and you would like to keep those. Um, we, I like to, I have a lot of friendship garden in my uh, flower and herb section, and when I save those seeds, they remind me of that person who gave me that uh, plant originally. And, uh, you know, it's another thing. Even, I, the thing about flowers and herbs is if you're a container gardener, you can actually save enough flower and herb seeds to really amount to something. And most, uh, many of them uh, will do well with just one plant. So that's pretty good. Um, okay. Um, I, you know, which uh, plants to save seeds from? I say start out saving from ones that you know are heirlooms because you know that some regular person saved it somewhere. <laughs> Uh, and it's not going to be too complicated. Uh, try to get something from your most flavorable varieties. Um, the other thing about uh, kind of saving from an heirloom from somebody you know is you can ask them what they do and how they save them because oftentimes uh, timing is of the essence when you're doing your um, urban flowers. Ones that you want to avoid is um, hybrids. Uh, ones that require a lot, a big isolation distance and you don't have control. Like if you're in a neighborhood and, uh, you know, it's something that uh, mixes readily, you might, you know, you, you might not want to uh, try that. <laughs> okay. Uh, a lot of self-sowing uh plants I don't actually save seeds unless I want to give it to someone else I just let them come up where they want to and then I move them to where I would like them okay now these are categories that I use when I'm talking with the uh, interns at our farm doesn't have anything to do with any great biological anything it's just like a way of um, kind of identifying plants and thinking about what you got to do with them and uh, we'll go to the pod bursters, the seed spillers, you know, the ones that will hold them, and then the ones that kind of have a closed pod or head that will hold together for longer. I'll go through each of those. 
uh, pod boosters, you got to get them uh, before they are completely and totally dry. Because guess what happens when they're smack dry? <laughs> And the seeds are everywhere, so you, you don't want to do that. Um, and one way, you know, as they're approaching dryness, I, I usually tell people to wait later in the day until your seeds are thoroughly dry before harvesting them. But these are a good thing to get when uh, when they have a little dew on them because they're not as likely to, sh to burst open right there in your hand. And violet sweet peas or something like that. Balsam does it all the time. That thing just... <laughs> I sometimes take kids out in the garden when I know they're ready and have them touch them to have that experience of them just bursting open right in their hand. Uh, okay. Seed spillers are a little bit uh, similar that you kind of need uh, to get them because they get all these ripe seeds and they're standing upright, you know, um, but at a certain point, they turn over and spill out. So again, you want to get them, uh, like if you're, you know, looking at the uh, plant when it when it's starting to turn brown, but not waiting until it's fully brown. Like when there's only like a quarter of an inch or something of the stem that's uh, near the one to get those seeds off of there, or they will fall over again. Seed holders are pretty good. Uh, they will shatter if they're fully dry and you touch them, but they're not as picky as the bursters, and they don't uh, move so far away when they open up. Uh, and, and again, what you want to do, like look at, at that pod. It's not real dark brown, you know, and the seeds are uh, ready. It's, it has turned, you know, tan a little bit. Um, and you want to, you know, get those at that point. Um, something that I was thinking about, about a few things that you can do, which I'd <laughs> forgotten, is all of these ones that have this tendency, you have uh, some tools that you can use to not have that happen. You can take pieces of reme or gauze, uh, you know, or little bits of scream and tie them around the ripening seed head so that you can catch those seeds if they decide that they, if you forget them before the time when they disperse. Okay, and how do you know about this? Well, you can read a book. There, there, you know, Mark Rogers has this little book about seed saving and has a bunch of stuff about flowers. There's places on, online that have it. But really, observation will tell you. If this is a plant that you have... Uh, grown before you can kind of see where the flower is and what you know kind of you know seed pot or seed head uh, forms and just watch it and see what happens so that you can know uh, you know these things um, and uh, when in doubt when they start to when the pod is fully formed I will cover them with something and wait to see what happens so that I have some seed of it, especially if it's a new thing they only have a, a little bit of seed of, rather than lose it all while you're trying to figure out exactly when it's ripe. <laughs> okay, uh, my friend Mr. Brown Thumb, I was complaining uh, to, that I didn't have a good pleasure of calendar because they're so interesting to look at. And he says... If you put my logo on it, I'll send you some. I said, I will, and then people will know about your website and go and visit you. So anyway, um, the calendula, you know, flower is pretty like that, and you see those funny-looking little green things, and then they ripen up, you know, to be these little curled uh, seed pods. And that's, that's the kind of thing that you do. Just look, you know, every few days. Uh, you know, most things are ready over a period of two weeks, so you can, you know, get that. And generally speaking, all the first, if you start looking at one of the first few flowers, you'll have figured out what's going on before the majority of your seed is ready. Four o'clocks, uh, you know, I mean, they look um, really nice. And then they make those, well, see the black seed? First, you can see that it'll be a little green thing in there. 
and then uh, the thing is when they're fully ripe, it detaches and it will fall in the ground so that you'll have many, many four o'clock cells. So, but, so you need to kind of pay attention when it's turned brown to get those, to knock them into your paper bag uh, rather than onto the ground. One thing that I've done with them, <laughs> I have to say we use a lot of row cover in our, in our winter garden. And you know, I have to save all the leftover pieces. So I make, uh, for things like four o'clocks, I make a little tree skirt like you would on a Christmas tree and put it underneath so that I can easily pick up the seeds that have fall, fallen out since I'm an old lady and I don't go out there every day. Uh, okay, large heads like dill, parsley, and so forth. Um, they're kind of easy to see. They're big, they're up there. But again, you know, when they're fully ripe, they will fall right off. So what you need to do is look at them uh, and notice, you know, as they ripen, and kind of notice what they look like before you go there and the head is there and the next day there are no seeds on it so that you can uh, pick the right time to get them. But again, the earliest ones will do this. And if you're in doubt and you think they're, you're about to lose that one, you can cover it and see how many days it takes before it's ready. Okay. Um, and the reason I'm saying about this looking at it is the longer you allow the seed heads to mature on the plant, the bigger and plumper and nicer seeds you have, as long as you don't go too long and lose them to the ground. So, um, you know, so that's uh, important. And um, some of these things, like uh, the umbrellas like we were talking about, they have uh, primary ones. Like, you know how they start out with like one or two flowers at the beginning, and those are going to be great big plump juicy seeds and you want to make sure you get those but you can get very good seeds from the secondary or tertiary if your plant is big and robust and the and the growing conditions are well, well. but you can't get them all at the same time so you're going to have to go through and uh, pick those seeds as they're ready okay um <laughs> the birds, uh, another reason for paying attention about this ripeness deal is honest to goodness. You know, everything's going along. Nothing cares about these things. You leave them out there. And one day, this, is, this happened to me with sunflowers when I was first doing this. I had all these beautiful sunflowers. I had all these beautiful sunflower seeds. One day, and I got up in the morning, there was no sunflower seeds. None. Zilch. It's like a, a flock of birds had just come in and had lunch and gone moving along. So, um, you know, you might, again, use that old reme to cover them up when they're uh, ripening to keep your feathered friends from getting things that wouldn't necessarily fall over on you. Um, okay. So, drying. Um, you want to have a place that is warm-ish, but not really hot. So, we look... Because we're in the south, we say 70 to 95 degrees, because there are times when the outdoor temperature is 100. And there is no, you know, the, without air conditioning, you can't have indoor temperatures that are under the 90s. And seats do okay, but you, you need uh, good ventilation. Uh, you want to spread your seeds you know, in a, in a single layer. If you have them in paper bags, which we often do with things that kind of spill or that are little, uh, you don't fill it up too full. You want to have some air circulation even inside of those uh, bags. Uh, yeah. And those pod bursters that I told you, they'll like this. I'm telling you, if you don't close that bag fully, they won't come out of the top of the bag. It's just, Okay, something that we uh, like to use is we have a little box. You've probably seen one when you went on. A lot of people go on the tour uh, and see the drying facilities here. This is the best thing. You just make a little box. The first one we made, it was out of cardboard. And, uh, and we put uh, some little screen things in it and put a little fan. And, and uh, it really helps you because you can put stuff on the screen 
You can take little bags. Those are the little pieces of the ever-present row cover. Uh, and they make really good drying sacks. So you can have like 30 different things in one little small area. And uh, the fan is giving enough air circulation uh, that your stuff you know, will dry quickly enough. Okay. Uh, evening primrose seeds. And these are some of those ones where they ripen slowly up. Don't wait until the ones at the very top are ready because the ones at the bottom will have slowly peeled out and uh, dribbled out the seeds. So you kind of pick a time in between, like maybe when it's about halfway up and say good enough and bring it in. And it might happen that the uh, ones at the top will finish ripening because of sucking up, uh, you know, whatever is in the stem, but they might not. Those, But I would say the bottom half of... Uh, the row is what's going to give you the best seeds any old how. Okay. See that label. Whatever your deal is about labeling, make sure it's on everything. And make sure it's on everything in a way that's hard to get separated from the seeds. So when we often we put a little piece of paper in the bottom of whatever container we put it in that says what it is and then we put a sign, something on the outside of it that says what it is because i'm telling you you cannot tell those seeds apart once they are dry you might think you can but unless you are different than everybody else i know you're kidding yourself okay um so <laughs> You can wait until for quite a while, like, you know, sometimes stuff that I have in bags, I just leave it there for two months and uh, in a dry, well ventilated place. But if you need to get the stuff to be a little bit smaller, you can do uh, some cleaning, you know, just after a few days and put it on a screen, make it have less volume. Uh, but then you still need to dry it more because we keep a lot of our small seeds in a freezer and you really need to get that seed very dry. And uh, in order to do that, you just pretty much need to dry it for a good long time. And uh, what you know, I say for people at home is dry it until you think it's dry and dry it two weeks more. <laughs> uh, so. And you can use uh, a lot of different things at home to do it. We use uh, stainless steel mixing bowls often for very these tiny seeds. You know, you've used uh, different ways of cleaning them, but you can put it different size of bowls. Uh, you can winnow better from them. And we often blow tiny seeds just with our breath. And so you get some different size bowls and screens and stuff to use with them. Uh, these are all our fancy screens, but we have a whole set that's kind of like that, that we made ourselves out of stuff. You know, window screen. Uh, we went to the hardware store, and they, I don't know what this stuff is for, but they have different kinds of things, different kinds of screen, and we just got a piece of every kind. And uh, a thing that's really important in making your home screens is to make the frames the same size so that you can fit, really fit them one on top of the other. It makes life so much easier. Uh, okay. Um, and, you know, the, that's, those are those Tina James that we had up there. And, uh, you know, to get them off, we will often just take a bowl like this and knock them in there. And then uh, there in time, uh, Irina has a couple of screens there. So um, the top screen uh, will uh, keep the big stuff out. The second one will kind of catch the screens. And then the container below is going to catch all the fine stuff. And there they are. And that's when they're like that is when I, we often will just uh, take and blow that stuff off. Okay, and there she is, blowing away. Uh, do remember to put something over your eyes, because that stuff will blow into your face. And actually, if it's really dust, it'll get up your nose, too. So some people put a little face mask on. Okay, pod busters. I, I love these things that are like that. They're just so cool, you know? But those are things that you got to be careful. Now they're here and now they're on the ground. So those are good ones to, you know, uh, if you're to, you know, make and get them when they're light tan rather than dark 
and put them in a bag or something that's going to catch your seeds when they're ready. Okay. Uh, you know, where are you going to store this stuff? I said, we freeze ours. But, you know, any kind of cool dry place can work. But I, if you're going to keep seeds for a long time, either refrigeration or uh, a freezer is good. But here's the thing. They don't need to take up. These are flowers and herbs. You don't need that much. They don't need to take up very much space. So I use these little uh, from our trial gardens, which is kind of more like a home garden. It's just a little bit of this and that just to see what happens in certain circumstances. And also for me, it's things that I'm not really familiar with to see if they actually will come true in the way that I think that they will. So I, you know, so I put them in what we call our herb garden, which is the play garden that's close to where my house is. And there's everything in its sister-in-law there. Uh, and, you know, I'll save some and I just put those little Ziploc bags of it. And then I take a mason jar because I read in the Kew Garden report that uh, they found that a mason jar just with a hand-tight seal uh, kept seeds better than any, you know, commonly available things, you know, beyond those uh, foil things that are uh, heat sealed or something. So I use mason jars and I just put, you know, all of these little containers in there. I have 30 different things in one quart mason jar and so you can just stick it in the back of the fridge if you want to. And remember, did I tell you, there's a lid on everything. Whatever you do, put that, li that label so that you can uh, keep track of your stuff. Um, you know, and the great thing is that al almost, well, pretty much all herbs and flowers until you get into sort of, you know, uh, fancy things like ginseng or something like that are dry seeded. And that makes it really pretty easy uh, to see when it's dry. I use as a rule of thumb when I don't know anything else that when there's a quarter inch of the stem is dry, probably the seed is dry enough that they'll be viable at that point. Okay. Uh, the anise hyssop, it's really pretty like that. Those little guys dry up and they, uh, you know, have little seeds around. And again, those are ones I stick them in a bag because they will fall out of there. Garlic chives or any of your chives. Really, the seeds form and are black, and they're very visible there, and it's easy to see when they're ready, and just knock them into a bag. Or you can cut it and, you know, have them finish drying there. But you want to wait until the seeds have turned dark on the plant of those before you harvest them. Okay. Uh, you know, all of these uh, different kinds of amaranths. Uh, they form the seeds along with the plants, and some of them, you know, are you can you can kind of see the little seeds, you know, in there uh, as they're drying. But usually, when they have when when you can see those little dark seeds along there, then you can cut uh, cut that and put it in a bag, cut off the flower head and put it in a bag and let it finish drying some more, and then uh, separate them out. Borage, you got to catch it before it hits the ground because I declare, you know, as soon as they're ripe, they fall off and hit the ground. So, uh, and then they self sow borage everywhere. Uh, so, again, this is definitely one, but they make lots of seeds. So, that's one to just kind of look at and see what it looks like just before they're ready to fall off and, uh, and then start harvesting them like that. Okay. Uh, Coriander, uh, they only, you know, what's nice about herbs too, and many flowers, is they, they only cross with things that are in their own, uh, you know, family. And you can have 35 or 75 different families in your uh, herb and ornamental garden, all right there, cheek to jowl, and, uh, and they won't cross. It's so exciting. You know, you just need to, know what the family is and uh, when you don't know you can do my little experiment uh, you can guess and do my experiment and see if your stuff comes out cross style but that's just that one year because you can try again next year okay uh, and this 
<laughs> you can't really see this very well. I forgot. This is a cucumber leaf uh, sunflower. It's one of the native sunflowers. And when I first started seed saving, it actually wasn't vegetables. I saved seeds for good 15 years before I ever saved a vegetable seed. I was like into native plants and stuff like that. And I was more into finding something in the spring and trying to label it and go back and find it so that I can save the seed from it uh, if something else hadn't eaten the seeds by the time I got back. And this is the, why that looking at it, because I would, you know, have if there was some real prize thing, I'd try to go like once a week and look at it until I saw what was going on. Uh, but I, I also discovered that these uh, rare things, one of the reasons they're rare is all the critters love to eat them. So, you know, you, you have to pay special attention to some of your native plants. Okay, uh, the Koshana is one of those ones that um, has a little pod that the seeds are in it. And generally speaking, you know, they just sit there. But if something shakes it, they kind of spill over and all the little seeds fall out. So um, when, and you see how it goes up to the top. So when about half of those are brown, the, has, those have dried up and their little pods are brown, bring them in because something uh, is going to hit up against them and knock all your seeds out of the ground. Uh, basils, uh, you all have probably, if you've grown basil, you've gotten to see what the seed bracts look like. Um, Sometimes, some basils, it's pretty easy to separate them from the brack. Some of them, they um, hold on really tight, and you have to really crush them and so forth uh, to get them out. One of the nice things about basils is they only cross-pollinate with basils that are in the same family, so you might uh, be able to grow holy basil and Eritrean basil and uh, some sweet basil in the same area close to each other and they won't cross. That's why often people see their holy basil come back all the time because it doesn't really cross with any of the other basils. Okay, um, parsley, you know, uh, it's really a, a biennial and so you get a lot more seeds from plants that either were, you know, uh, carried over from the year before, or that got started very early and then put out early so they got enough chill. Uh, they were big enough and got enough chill factor uh, early in the season to make a lot of seeds. Okay, and uh, you know, there's black eyed Susans and stuff. Uh, they're another one of those things you kind of wait for about a um, quarter inch of the stem to be ripe. You put them in, you let them dry some more. And if all is well, they separate out easily. And if all is not, you spend a long time blowing that out. You can use a fan also. So it will win away. Uh, I put in this purple hyacinth bean because I think they're so beautiful. And their seeds are so funny looking. You know, you can uh, tell when they're ready. They have like, the seed is like black and it has a little white thing, which I don't know the name of, uh, stick it out, uh, and um, it's a really interesting uh, looking seeds, and I, I, I like to do seed art projects with kids, and so some things I grow just because they look cool in the seeds. What can I say? Uh, okay, and uh, yeah, with the sage, again, there were one of those things that is up on a... Uh, nice thing and the seeds are sticking out like this and there's one in each little uh, pod and you know the nice thing about knowing what a seed looks like ripe is you can use your seed packets save a few seeds in it so that you know what it's supposed to look like when it's fully ripe because <laughs> sometimes you don't you know you don't remember and uh, so it's okay a uh, few you know things that, are, that I think are easy to uh, save, uh, you know, flowers from, and uh, if there's ones that you have, just because the seed is easy, it doesn't so quickly jump off of, <laughs> out and burst around, and uh, and you can just get, if you haven't been saving, you know, flower and herb seeds, you can just get your feet wet with some of these guys. Uh, I had to put a picture 
of the roselle because I know that many of you have not grown it. It's so pretty. Look at those things that, that dry up like that. It looks so cool. And um, it's related to okra. So you need, you need warmth. If you're, gonna, uh, if you're any place cold, you want to start it uh, inside. But, uh, you know, and so you may or may not uh, be able to get seed this far up. But fortunately, uh, as soon as the seed is beginning to form, not when it's complete, you have this nice swollen calyx, which is what you use for making tea. So many people can get the tea, even though they don't really get but a, one or two seeds. But you know, each plant is like three feet tall, like a big old ochre thing. So you only need a few seeds to keep you going from year to year. I love them. Uh, here is, uh, if you want to see a chance to come out to Virginia, we do uh, an annual event at Monticello uh, called the Heritage Harvest Festival. You get to see all the gardens at Monticello. You get to see all of us. We try to have 50 workshops. Uh, we try to have 100 things between melons, peppers, uh, and tomatoes for you to taste, and uh, many people doing all kinds of homesteading skills and so forth in, as they say, a world-class location.